have Dr. Uh, oh, oh, recording. Song Yan Li from uh, Rutgers University uh, to give a talk. And uh, Song Yan received his uh, you know, PhD from uh, Brown University under the uh, supervision of uh, Hong Jidang uh, in 2020. So right now he's a uh, Hill Assistant Professor at Rutgers University. Uh, today his uh, uh, title of the talk is Mixed Dirichlet to Conormal Problem for Parabolic Equation. Yeah, your turn. Okay. Uh, thank you. Let me uh, share my screen. Okay. Um, should be a presentation mode. Never mind. Okay. Uh, thank you for your invitation and kind introduction. Uh, today I want to talk about this parabolic mix, uh, duration of normal problems, and this. Uh, these are some use and drop works with Chung Kong Choi from Busan and uh, Professor Dong from Brown and, and myself. Okay. So okay, uh, this is our problem. So we discuss the divergence from elliptic equation. And okay, so this is the equation, the operator, it's divergence form. So you assume this leading coefficient to be uh, symmetric and bounded from below and above uniform elliptic. And uh, we assume zero boundary considering initial conditions. So the initial data is not important here. And the domain is a cylinder, zero, zero to t times this omega, omega is the base, is the base. And the interesting part is on the boundary, the lateral boundary, uh, this uh, boundary of uh, this boundary of q, say uh, zero t times so this should be boundary of omega, are uh, separated into two parts, B and N. And on D, we are assuming this Dirichlet boundary condition U equals to zero. And on the other part, we have this normal boundary condition, DU equals to GI and I. See, this DU is this normal operator associated with L, okay? And here we call these boundary conditions homogeneous because uh, if we do the change of variable, and there is no, uh, if we, sorry, if we consider the weak formulation, then there is no boundary terms coming out. Okay. And up here, clearly for the Dirichlet part, it's homogeneous because it's zero. Okay, uh, so this is the problem. And okay, and we are going to solve this problem for the weak solutions. So in the H1P or H1Q P. So this space, these spaces are the usual LP or LQP based subject spaces for parabolic equations, weak solutions. And each one P is like W1P for elliptic. So U in LP, the U in LP and some condition on UT, which is required for, for a parabolic equation. And H1QP is the mixed norm space. That's where, whenever we take LP norm. So here LP means LP in space time. And when, whenever we take LP norm here, we take LP, LQ in T, LT in X, uh, LP in X. Okay, so this is the solution space for weak solution. The, the usual. Okay, and for this problem, it does, it does not make sense to solve for uh, smooth solutions because near gamma, this solution is not smooth. So in some sense, this H1P is the optimal space we can uh, expect. And this optimal means this solubility range for Q is optimal. And we will see this later. And this is optimal even for heat equations in the slow setting. Okay, so our aim is to find the minimum assumptions in order to obtain the solubility for this weak solution in this spaces and in this uh, optimal, uh, in, this, in the optimal range of P and Q. Okay, and this is the optimal regularity. So in this picture, uh, we consider the, uh, the function u, which is the imaginary part of z to the one half. So this is 2D picture. So clearly this function is harmonic on the upper half space. And it satisfies the mixed boundary condition on the real axis separated by this origin, okay, by a point. And of course here, everything is smooth enough but if you compute du, it's like uh, one over distance squared, uh, distance to the one half 
then this is only in L4 minus epsilon, it's not in L4. So it's not smooth near the origin. Okay, and so if you, um, so, so this means uh, the optimal solution space is H1 4 minus epsilon. Okay, so this example is for Hitty, uh, for Laplace equation, but you can simply generalize this to uh, Hitty equation um, with higher spatial dimension. Okay, so this H1 4 minus epsilon is optimal. Yeah. And of course, this optimal regularity can be measured in some other spaces like it's not an initial maximal function like phase of spaces, et cetera. We will uh, say something about this later. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay uh, now let me mention some history of studying this mixed problem. And let me start from the elliptic case. So for elliptic equations, uh, there are some study on smooth domains. As we said, even on smooth domains, the solution is not smooth, right? There's no, uh, no shorter theory, a simple shorter theory like usual elliptic equation. And there are some old time res results I should name on WS in WSP, in particular W1 4 minus epsilon. So this is very old. And recent, uh, not, very far, uh, not very far ago, this is, there is a result by Savri in base of space, uh, this base of space. And this is also optimal, uh, optimal space, but he measured in the this of space, not in this uh, W1P. Okay, so this is in uh, our smooth domain. And uh, there, it's more interesting to study non-smooth domains. And a very interesting direction is to study Laplace or heat equations with base of or LP plus W1, LQ plus W1Q boundary data. Okay, there are a lot of research on this, but we will come back to this later. So let's not mention too much about this. Uh, right now, okay, there are a lot of literature on this, and there are also some research on other uh, on systems like the Stokes system, uh, uh, like yeah, Stokes system, the May system, the elliptic system. But let me just mention this one, and there are a lot of other research. Uh, research. Okay, and it also it's also worth mentioning that when this elliptic operator is Laplacian, say the equation is Hitty equation or Laplace equation. Uh, this mixed problem in this case uh, is mixed derivative Newman boundary condition. Uh, it's called the Zeremba problem in the literature. Okay. This is the elliptic case. And for the parabolic case, this problem arises naturally uh, with free boundary problems. For example, if we study, uh, if we want to model the melting procedure of a floating S, ice, so this is ice, this is water. This is air. Okay, then we clearly know that the water ice interface will have zero temperature, so it's the Ritchie boundary condition. And above uh, this uh, sea level, uh, the ice air interface will be insulated, so you have this, uh, this human boundary condition. So we naturally have a mixed problem here. And also, it's studied in the combustion theory and some biology problems, et cetera. And mathematically, there are also some research on this parabolic uh, equation with mixed boundary condition. And uh, most study are uh, focused on this LP based doublet spaces, weak solution, but P, this P is equal to, either equal to or close to two. Okay, there are a lot of study on this, but it's different from ours, so that's not mentioned too much. And what we want is uh, the solubility for weak solution for P away from two, okay? So in particular, we want the optimal range, say P less than four minus epsilon. It's optimal for the heat equation on the upper, upper half space in the smooth state. Okay, so this is our aim. And to motivate our results on uh, mixed problems, let me also mention the results for or let me start with the results from uh, for Dirichlet and Kronormal problem, purely Dirichlet or purely Kronormal problems. Okay, and we know that uh, if we want the solubility in W1P or H1P for P not close to two, right, far away from two, then of course we will need some regularity on EIJ or boundary of omega. And there are some kind of examples showing that some kind of regularity is indeed needed. It cannot be dropped. 
And for purely Dirichlet and uh, purely Kunawa problem, we have the following interesting results in 11 and 12 by Don and Kim. Um, here, the regularity on AIJ, the leading coefficients are partial VMO. So in the paper, it's called variably partial VMO. Okay, it's still it's, uh, some, somehow a little bit complicated, but basically it's partial, partial VMO. And the boundary is only assumed to be locally flat. So we will give a rigorous definition of this later. But the spirit is that this domain is only close to a hyperplane locally in the sense of uh, host of dimension, host of distance. Okay, so it's very it can be very rough. And under these assum regularity assumptions, then we have the W1P solubility for all P between one and infinity. Okay, this is the elliptic result. And we also obtain some partial results on parabolic equations in H1P. Okay. Um, okay, uh, let me explain that this uh, it, this partial VMO assumption is a generalization of the VMO, usual VMO assumption. The VMO assumption is the usual one we assume for W1P theory, LP theory. And the VMO assumption means um, this EIG, the oscillation of EIG measured in, the, in this uh, average sense or this mean oscillation goes to zero as R goes to zero. Okay, partial, then partial VMO means uh, we can allow these coefficients to to be measurable, to be only measurable in one of the spatial direction, depending on the domain. It can change, this direction, direction can change, so it's called variably uh, partially VMO. But here in our paper, in our next problem, oh, we do not allow the coefficient, we do not allow such measurable directions, so let's not go too far in this direction. So we just assume the usual VMO assumption and the leading coefficients will not be a problem. Okay, and the more interesting part here is the regularity for the boundary. So we only assume the boundary to be locally flat. And the usual assumption for, for the LP theory, for the W1P theory is small Lipschitz or C1. Small Lipschitz means it's a Lipschitz graph and with small constant. And C1, of course, means it's a C1 graph. So under these two assumptions, we can uh, locally map this domain to the half space to have a problem on the half space with same kind of coefficients. So the VMO structure can be preserved under this change of variable. And this change of variable is just, just comes from this uh, representation for function of the boundary. Okay. So in this case, the, uh, the problem is not so different from the problem on the upper half space. And of course, for the locally flat domain, you know, we will say it's not a graph domain, so this flattening is not allowed. Okay. So spirit here is that once we have the locally flatness, then we have the W1P solubility. And uh, I should also say for elliptic parabolic equations on locally flat domains, there are also some, a series of papers by Bion and Wang. But let's just move on to, to introduce our result instead of uh, staying too long with the history. Okay. So this is our first main result. Uh, the, a weak solution solubility. So, so we call this is our equation, the mixed problem with divergence form operator and mixed boundary condition. These two uh, boundary, uh, these two part of the boundary uh, are separated by an interfacial boundary called gamma. Okay, this is N, this is D. This gamma can be graph, can depends on time. Okay, so how result is, uh, for any p between four, th four thirds and four, okay, p less than four is optimal here, we call our uh, example. Uh, then if the boundary and the interfacial boundary are both uh, sufficient flat, locally flat, this is a written very flat assumption, and EIJ is small BMO, okay, here small BMO means uh, almost VMO with uh, allowing small jump, so this is classical. And then for any LP right-hand side, you can find a unique each one key weight solution with the estimate. Okay, so this is our first result, main result for the unmixed law. And we can also obtain a result for the mixed law. That means if we have higher integrability in T for the right-hand side, then we have higher integrability in T for the solution. Okay. And so basically under the same type of assumptions, 
locally flat on the boundary, BMO, uh, BMO load feeding coefficients with possibly further smaller uh, parameters here. So for any LQ in T, LP, and X right hand side, okay, we have different capability in P and X, in P and X then we can solve in this mixed norm sort of space for the unique solution with the same index, with the same absolute. Okay, and this is the estimate. And for the following is a picture, is a graph for the range of Q. And basically it says that when P is less than two, there's no restriction on Q for any Q, uh, Q between P and infinity. When P is less than, two, uh, when P is greater than two for this range, Okay. Then we have some restriction on, on Q, but there are still some higher integrability in T direction because we can take some Q greater than T. Okay. This is a mixed norm estimate. Okay. So any questions so far for the result? Okay, I guess we actually gave the formal definition for the infinite planets. So this is a picture for the Wittenberg flat domains, and I steal it from somebody else slides because uh, I'm too lazy to draw it on my own by my own. But anyway, uh, this is a very nice picture. Um, this Wittenberg flatness means uh, if the boundary is Wittenberg flat or locally flat in the literature, in some literatures, it means that at all small scale, at all scale smaller than R0, if we look at the boundary inside a ball BR, Okay, this ball should have simple at the boundary. Then this part of boundary inside this ball can be trapped between two disks with distance two gamma r. Okay, so these two, uh, two disks or these two hyperplanes are pretty close to each other. Uh, the distance is two gamma r. And this definition is interesting for gamma very, very small. So this is really, this boundary is really very close to a hyperplane in the sense of uh, Hausdorff distance. Okay, and this picture is, as I, as I said, this picture is very good because it shows some interesting, uh, a typical phenomena for this kind of boundary that this, um, at any point, uh, this, this, uh, this boundary can go in any direction, it can go forward, it can go backwards, there are some turning points on the boundary and it can be very rough. Uh, it's not a smooth domain type or it's not a graph domain. Okay, on the right, I have a picture for this uh, flatness of the interfacial boundary. We know this interfacial boundary gamma lives on the boundary. So naturally it's, uh, it's trapped between the original two disks coming from the definition. And furthermore, uh, this gamma can be trapped between two, uh, we, we know this gamma, gamma has two dimension two on the boundary. Uh, yeah, it has two dimension two, so it can be further trapped between two disks or two, uh, two hyperplane in a perpendicular direction, okay? And so it's, it's trapped, locally it's trapped in this tube. Okay, originally I draw a tube, I draw a wrong tube, but doesn't matter, the tube is wrong or square. Okay, so this is the flatness for, for the, uh, for the interfacial boundary. So this is our assumptions. Okay, locally flatness. So now let me give some remarks on this Riffenberg flat domains or this Riffenberg flatness. It's introduced by Riffenberg in 1960s, uh, actually in a series of paper, not just one paper, while in investigating the plateau problem and it's been studied a lot in the free boundary problems and by the geometry meta theory community. That's where my picture comes from. And so now let me just give a few interesting remarks on this. So typically this kind of domain can contain fractal structures. So the turning behavior in the last picture will occur. So it's not necessarily a graph domain. And a typical example is this snowflake for the fractal, for, for the fractal. And if we want the flatness, then we need to start from n polygon for n very, very large, then uh, yeah, things can be as, as flat as we want. And yeah, due to this example, you can clearly see that 
uh, this boundary can have higher host of dimension, host of dimension higher, higher than d minus one, okay, strictly greater than d minus one. So it can be rough in some sense. And yeah, perhaps the most famous uh, theorem about this, this kind of domain is, this kind of set is this topological disk theorem. So locally, uh, this, this uh, if you flat set, this boundary can be mapped by a, by, uh, by a, by a holder map, by a holder homomorphism to a disk, D, a D minus one dimensional disk. Okay. And as this flatness parameter goes to zero, this alpha will, goes to one, will go to one, then this, uh, this boundary becomes more and more uh, regular. And in particular, this boundary uh, the host of dimension of the boundary uh, goes to d minus one. Okay. But it's all, it, it can be always greater than, uh, strictly greater than this d minus one, because if you really want Lipschitz alpha equals to one, then you need to assume more assumptions on the boundary rather than just using our flatness. Okay, so this is a typical uh, rough, rough domain. And the last thing I want to say for this is that this small Riefenberg flat domain is always a suspension domain for the W1P functions. So W1P function supported inside this domain can be extended outside. So you have all the sublet inequalities. So these are basic tools for, for our equations for PDEs. Okay. Uh, the last about uh, last thing about our result is that uh, we want to make some remarks on this interfacial boundary. So I guess I should draw a picture about it. So assume this is the boundary of omega, a boundary of Q, it's the natural boundary of Q. Then and, and the boundary is separated onto, into two parts. So n should be typically on the left, right, and this interfacial boundary is gamma, okay? And in this, uh, in, this in our uh, results, we allow this gamma to be to, to depend on time. So we typically we lose control of dt near this gamma. Okay, we cannot differentiate the equation or anything. So uh, this creates one of the problem in our, uh, our proof. But uh, yeah, this is one of the problem, lose control of dt. And also our gamma can be more general than locally flat. We can allow this gamma to be locally close to a Lipschitz graph in M spatial variables. Okay, when it's a graph of zero variables, so then it's just a hyperplane. And when it's a, uh, just a general Lipschitz function can depends on, depending on all the other variables of co-dimension B minus two, then it's just a Lipschitz graph. But the interesting thing here is that if this M, if this Lipschitz graph depends on less variable, okay, when this M is smaller, this solubility range of T can be larger. Okay, uh, when M equals zero, this range is just four thirds to four. And when M is D minus two, this range is the smallest, but still away from two. Okay, and I think it's just, 2d over d plus one to 2d over d minus one, okay? Only depends on d and away from two. So this is some generalization of our result. I will mention this because uh, we will make some interesting co uh, comparison in an application of our results. Okay, so, so far everything for our results. Any, anything I could clarify? before moving on to the application. Okay, so I think uh, I should mention one interesting application of our result. That is, now we want to solve the equation, say the Hitty equation or Laplace equation with non-zero boundary data or inhomogeneous boundary data, okay? Now the source term is zero. So we consider either Laplace equation or heat equation. So here we use the Laplace equation as an example, and there are some also some work on heat equations. 
Okay, then if you want to solve a problem like this with mixed boundary condition, then we might want this boundary data to be more regular than the trace, usual trace space. So this is the trace space for the W12, uh, sorry, W12 weak solution. And so if the solution, if the boundary data is in the trace space, then it's, there's no problem at all as long as the trace is defined and bounded. So the problem is if the boundary data is smoother than the tree space, can we get a smoother solution? But we know that the boundary data, there is no point of making the boundary data too smooth because there is optimal regularity, so we cannot go beyond that. And the natural boundary data below this optimal regularity space is LP, LQ space for the human data and W1Q for the duration data. Okay, here W1Q means uh, this GD, the duration data itself, is in LQ and its tangential derivative is also in LQ. So these two boundary conditions will have the same regularity level. So this is a problem with LQ, W1Q boundary data. And now to solve this, the first thing is to make sense of the boundary condition. And the natural way is the non tangential limit. It is a natural way of understanding the boundary behavior of a harmonic function. And um, so here we give a, give a rigorous definition, but roughly speaking, at any point of the boundary, we take a non-tangential accessible region. Okay, so basically it's just a cone or some twisted cone. And within this region, you can only, uh, you can only uh, achieve, uh, approach the boundary down in a non-tangential direction, okay? You cannot be too close to the boundary. And what we want is if we approach this boundary point in this non-tangential direction, then the solution and its derivative will, will converge to the boundary data uh, almost everywhere. Okay, so this is the meaning of the non-tangential limit. Okay, uh, of course, uh, naturally, if we, want to if we want to discuss some limit, and then we want to bound the non tangential maximal function, the maximal function. And this is how we make sense of this uh, problem. Okay, so besides this usual equation and boundary condition, we also require this boundary, uh, this non tangential maximal function of du is in LQ. Okay. Once we have this, this, this kind of boundedness, then uh, by standard or usual for two step theorem, uh, the non tangential limit of, of this uh, normal derivative of the or the function itself will converge to the boundary data non tangentially. Oh, sorry, I should say, yeah, the boundary condition is satisfied in the sense of uh, non tangential limit. So, this is standard Fatou's type theorem. We only need to bound this non tangential maximal function. And now, if for the to motivate again to motivate the mixed problem. Let me introduce the results for the Newman problem first. And for the Newman problem, there are some research on the Lipschitz domains. Right? Now the results on smooth domains are classical. Right? It's just like a disk. So, so on a disk, it's a textbook example. So on smooth domain, or well, something about C1, there are some result, results, say uh, at least 50 or, yeah, 50 or 40 years ago by some layered potential. And the interesting part is on Lipschitz domain. Okay. And if we if we only assume the boundary to be Lipschitz, then there are solubility in LQ for Q between one and two plus epsilon, with epsilon can be or should be very, very small, depending on some geometry and, and something on, on the off the boundary. Okay. But this is a result of uh, Dalberg and Kenning. And when the boundary is small Lipschitz, say uh, more regular than Lipschitz, uh, it's a Lipschitz graph with small constant, then we can have the solubility for all Q between one and infinity. Okay, so it's uh, it's consistent with the previous weak solution for full range of uh, that. If we want the solubility for full range of P W one P, then we need some regularity on the boundary. Okay, so here the same spirit. Okay, uh, now for the mixed problem, we cannot 
expect the solubility for all Q between one and infinity because the optimal regularity is L2 minus epsilon. Uh, that's the non tangential maximal function of BU is in L2 minus epsilon. If, you, if we just compute the previous uh, harmonic function on upper half space, that simple example, you can simply see that NDU is not in L2 near the interfacial boundary or near the origin in that example. Okay, so what we, uh, this is what we, what we can expect for the best result or best regularity. And I should also say that for the mixed problem, this is interesting even on smooth domains because the usual L2 methods uh, fails because its NDU is not in L2. So even uh, for smooth domain, we still need to do something. It's not as classical as Newman problem. Okay, so now this is the problem we are going to work on uh, by using our uh, main results uh, elliptic counterpart of the end results. Okay, so for this problem, there are some previous results. There are a lot of research on this in the past 25 or 30 years. Let me just mention the most recent two results. The first one is by Peter Alton Brown. He obtained the L1 plus epsilon solubility. So this is slightly better than L1 uh, if the boundary is only Lipschitz. And if this gamma is okay, very rough, so this condition runs with uh, upper alpha is regular of dimension close to D minus two, you can just imagine the host of dimension, a dimension of gamma is very close to D minus two. Close to D minus two. Can be only slightly lighter than that. You can imagine it in this way. And this satisfies the so-called Cox two condition. So this basically means that the, the set D cannot be too cannot be too small near on your gamma, and basically we don't we don't want this kind of thing. Okay, we don't want this to be gamma. This to be D. Yeah. This is too small, so the problem is not so good. Okay, so we really want something like this. Both part take a, a certain certain part of the bond. Both D and N take certain part of the boundary. We don't want any part to be dominated by D or dominated by N, like, like this. Okay, so this part is dominated by, by N. Okay, so this is L1 plus epsilon. So I should I should make some comparison that this com is comparable to the L2 plus epsilon results for human problem because we, we only assume the boundary to be Lipschitz. Okay, here the boundary is only Lipschitz. And if we want a better result, the solubility away from L1, then we need to assume some regularity on the boundary. So a recent result of Brown and Grail, they proved that uh, if the boundary is, is sufficient smooth, say C11, and if, if this gamma is Lipschitz, of course, it's much more regular than the previous condition. If she means the dimension is exactly D minus two, okay? And in this case, we have the LD over D minus one minus epsilon solubility. Uh, this D is a spatial dimension. This epsilon is very small. Uh, it's not two minus epsilon yet, but it's some, it's some good upper bound. Uh, it's some good range away from one. So this is still very interesting. The, for the previous one, we don't have any control of this epsilon, so it's very, very close to L1. But this one is, is not close. But it's still not optimal yet. And what we can expect is some similar results with the Newman problem. Uh, if the boundary is small Lipschitz, then for the Newman problem, we have, we have LQ solubility for all Q. And for this problem, we should have so LQ solubility in the optimal range, right? Q between one and two minus epsilon. And of course, for this problem, we need some condition on the interfacial boundary, but this is very weak. Okay. So what we can do using our uh, elliptic counterpart of the main theorem in this talk is this result. 
the resulting 20. Uh, so we proved that if the boundary is Lipschitz and the boundary is flat, locally flat, and also if the gamma is also lo locally flat, then we can have this L2 minus epsilon solubility for any epsilon uh, greater than zero. So we have the optimal solubility in the optimal uh, states. Okay. And I should say that this Lipschitz and locally flat of the boundary, this condition is strictly weaker than small Lipschitz. That's what we expect from the previous slide. Um, and there is a counter example. Okay. And also this result is, and uh, I should say this result is based on the L, W1 four minus epsilon probability of the mixed problem with homogeneous boundary condition obtained by us. Uh, two years ago. And this is the elliptic counterpart of the main theorem today. And if we want to make some comparison with the previous results, then uh, just like our main result, we can allow this gamma to be locally flat to a Lipschitz graph in M variables instead of just locally flat. That's the case when M equals to zero. So when M is D minus two, the largest possible uh, number, right? This gamma has two dimension two, so this largest one is minus two. And this solubility range is, is exactly the same with the one of Brown and Brown obtained in their paper. But of course, we allow this gamma to be a perturbation of Lipschitz graph, not just, not, and itself is not Lipschitz, and we allow this boundary to be very rough. So they assume the boundary to be C11 and we allow the boundary to be ellipses and locally flat. And of course, you know, I should say for heat equation, that's more relevant to this talk. And there are some results, uh, there are some work in progress using our uh, main results in this, in this talk. Okay, so any, anything I can, I can clarify? Okay, uh, that's still early, so I can, I can see something about the proof. Uh, okay, so here is the idea of the proof. We want to, we want to solve the equation in H1P, LP-based solid space. So I, I, as usual, we start from L2-based space, right? This is the usual procedure. And we all know that uh, for lifty problem, we don't, we don't need anything, any regularity on, on, on anything, right? It's just a progressivity. But for parabolic problem, uh, there are some issues because if this gamma depends on T, uh, there are some annoying problems in here. Um, when this gamma is independent of the time, say gamma is from gamma zero times, oh, sorry, I should say gamma equals to zero to T times gamma zero, this is space uh, set. When in this uh, time independent setting, we can just solve in the usual way, like the Galerkin's approach. That's the usual technique. But when this gamma depends on time, we need to give some assumption. Say we can assume the boundary to be continuous in T. Then we can approximate this gamma by some time independent set and discretizing time past the limit. Then we can solve this problem step by step. And uh, we, we don't claim that this continuous in key condition is sharp for L2 theory, but this is enough for us because it's guaranteed by our assumption. Uh, and also I should say there are some minor issues about the catastrophic inequality, but that's, that's just some technical problem that can be done okay, because of the discretization. Okay, now, once we have LP, L2 theory, we, we can almost get L2 plus epsilon theory, say W12 plus epsilon or H12 plus epsilon for parabolic, almost for free. Right? There's, a, some, there's some self improvement uh, phenomena. So, this is classical and it, it appears in many, many uh, papers and this standard, this, this kind of uh, gain of epsilon regularity. 
So essentially what we need is just the Kachopi inequality, energy inequality, and the sublet Poincaré inequality. So we bound du by u, then from u by du, again, some extra power from this sublet Poincaré. That's the usual procedure for elliptic parabolic problems. And essentially in this step, we only require the boundary to be uh, an extension domain, right? We only need the, the sublet inequalities. So a typical domain for this is the uni so-called uniform domain. And we need, we need near gamma this D to be not too small because we need the boundary condition really equals to zero on some part of the boundary in the inequalities. Okay, but this is again much weaker than what we assume in our main results. So this Ipsum regularity is, is cheap. Okay, the real problem is how to improve the regularity all the way up to L4 minus Ipsum. So that's uh, H1 4 minus Ipsum regularity, or the better regularity in T. We don't mention any mixed form, but the spirit of the Okay. Uh, so the idea of uh, proving this, this regularity is we use this level set argument. Right? We locally decompose this du into a rough part in L2. So some usual per, uh, perturbation arguments and the regular part in L4 minus epsilon. Then we inter interpolate this to estimate by estimating the, the decay of the level set. Right? So this is the interpolation theorem, let's call it. And the major difficulty for the elliptic problem is that uh, on, the, on the boundary, let me draw a picture. So uh, there is a transition region. So the problem is not like the smooth surface case, right? If gamma is smooth, then we just change from one boundary condition to another boundary condition across this smooth surface. But this problem is very bad. We have very rough trans, uh, surface, right? Can be turning. Very, very rough uh, interfacial boundary. So there is a there is a transition region in between, and the boundary condition is really mixed in this region. And we need to deal with this region. This is the major difficulty we imagine. And for the parabolic problem. Another difficulty is we need, uh, since this gamma depends on T in a non smooth way, we, need, we lose control of three T, so we also need to deal with that. So the idea is, but the main idea is just this interpolation argument. And the main lemma, main technical procedure of this proof is this decomposition lemma. So the most part of this paper is uh, devoted to this lemma. So as we said earlier, uh, locally we decompose this solution U, this H12 solution, the solution we got almost for free, uh, into two parts. So one part is rough, is L2, um, and the other part is regular, is in L Q for any Q less than four. So this part is good, and this L2 estimate, this G term is good, is harmless, is the source term, the right hand side, if the U term is bad, it's only L because the level side only have L2, but we have the smallest with one. So we can, and then we can call that this gamma is the smallest from badness, and theta is the smallest from the VMO assumption. Okay, eventually we will choose them to be small. This, this is the main lemma, and I guess, uh, okay, I should say that of this regular part V is actually the solution to the Haiti equation in the smooth step. So locally, we can compare the original problem to the Haiti equation on a half space. Okay, so this is the V. So basically the previous capital V is the V here. And this small V will satisfy the Haiti equation on the half cylinder and the boundary conditions are separated by x2 equals to zero, a hyperplane. Okay, and of course, this is a smooth setting and there are some classical results, say the uh, sublet space result, the basal space results, et cetera. And we can show that 
the EV is in L4 validation to achieve the optimal regularity. And here I will give up. In our paper, we give an intuitive proof by this change of variable to reduce the problem to, to the Dirichlet problem, but this result is standard. It's not so difficult. Okay, so this is a regular part. Then we use some procedure to do to construct the decomposition, but then you just skip it. Basically, we just use a way to combine the cutoff technique for the Dirichlet problem. Okay. The division problem we cut off near the boundary so that the, what's left is you lying in this uh, narrow region and it is small because of this small support. And for the normal problem, we use a reflection technique that is the solution satisfies an equation or a problem on the, on the upper half space with normal boundary condition. Uh, as for terms coming from the, the reflection, but they are still small because the only support in this narrow region. Okay, we need to find a way to, to combine these two arguments to, uh, for our mixed problem. And eventually, once we can prove the decomposition lemma, then we reach, uh, then we need to estimate this, uh, then we need to interpret them by using this level set argument. That is, we want to estimate the level set of the maximal function of the U. And we want to derive the decay rate of this level set. Okay, so roughly speaking, uh, for a very large kappa, uh, the level set AS, A kappa S, decays like kappa to the minus Q. This Q is any number less than four. So the first term has enough decay, right? We want the U in L4, so this minus four is good. Minus four plus epsilon is good. And this kappa minus two is not so good, but it has this smallness in form. So eventually you can hide this term by choosing the parameters to be small enough. And yeah, this is the, uh, this is the main argument after the decomposition, but this is kind of, uh, this is, has been used in some literatures. And I want to see that, uh, a previous decomposition lemma is a local result. Then how do you get from the local result to this global decay rate, right? This is global decay rate, right? This maximum function is defined on the whole omega. And so there is a coordinate of things spot lemma used by, first used by Krilov and Stefanov in their proof of high inequalities. And it's uh, actually a stopping time argument. So we can catch from the local decomposition to this global decay rate. And I think that's all for my talk today. And thank you. Yeah. Any uh, any questions? Uh, so, so for the uh, domain or the uh, interface. Mm -hmm. uh, if the uh, Lipschitz, but with a uh, small Lipschitz constant, can can your result be improved? You know? uh, our main results. Uh -huh. uh, no, <laughs> this is the optimal space. So, but if in small Lipschitz, if it's a Lipschitz domain with small Lipschitz constant, uh, if it's a Lipschitz domain, I think we can do basal space. Because it's, it's defined, so so. Uh, I guess the, the yeah. four is like upper bound, right? L four. Yeah, four is upper bound. Um, yeah, oh. the Soviet space this, this cannot be be uh, improved. I see. You don't have like any information about this, uh, this in a reference group flat, this uh, coefficient, any, anything like this uh, gamma zero in how small, you know. Uh, you know, the, small, you know it, 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 it must be or something. AIJ, the, the BMO. I mean, the, uh, the, the uh, 
the domain or the interface, you have this uh, Rosenberg flat, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How flat, you know? Is there any like uh, some oh. quantity of information? No. no. <laughs> I see. It just means sufficient small. Any any other questions? No. So maybe maybe one one question. So about this, yeah, um, uh, the range of the exponents. Uh, yeah. So it's it's really uh, dimension independent. So it's it does not really depend on the dimension. Um, is that also the case in the elliptic uh, elliptic problem? Uh, you mean the, the like this four four thirds to four? Uh, yeah, this is essentially a bound for for two dimensional problem. Um, yes. Yeah, if you, uh, I believe if you uh, study look closer, you might get something like l uh, l four minus epsilon x one x two l p x prime, it might have better integrability than the others. But yeah. Oh, no, we don't know that. <laughs> no, we don't know that. This is dimension. Okay. But we did know better integrability, integrability in T though. Mm-hmm. Any more questions? Okay, so if uh, no questions, I guess we send in early. So we have a nice talk. Thank you. All right, so. Mm-hmm.